and then we got it started. And then we are now, this camera stays in that position. Okay. And we can, they'll see us and okay. we've got this. So then we'll put it on.
Hello, Chicago. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Wonderful that you can hear us. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> so we can hear and see each other. Hello. So people, here's Federico. No, I can't change the camera. Hello. There's Federico. I'm going to mute us here. We can hear you very well. We can see you very well. Beautiful. I think we're all set in this room. So this is the topic of the workshop and Federico will be the leader and we will start in two minutes. Is it fine with you? Fine with you, Chicago? Sorry, say that again. I missed that. We will be starting in two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yes, it works for us. Good. It works for us.
Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not not in the summer though, but. But on which is that? Yeah, because that's why all the Norwegians who came to Australia in the nineteenth century they went to Minnesota <laughs> and Minnesota <laughs> because they felt that coming there. <laughs> So how cold it is in the winter? Not in the Celsius. <laughs> you can uh, go always uh, below twenty, even thirty sometimes okay. for weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it depends. It's usually like minus fifteen, minus twenty, minus twenty-five. Yeah. So it's like Norway. What? It's like Norway. Yeah, probably. <laughs> So we have all set. Okay. Let me try. Oh, this is so busy. Yes. Oh. Okay. Great. Right. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm a PhD student at the University of Minnesota. I'm working with Amy Pittinger, the department. We will be talking about performance review in pharmacy academia and how faculty and professor are uh, reviewed. Uh, this is just the outline. Uh, I will be discuss uh, a little bit about my background and the goals and challenges of performance review in pharmacy academia. Then we will be talking about the program evaluation and the use of logic models uh, to improve performance reviews. But I will be also talking about how to use program evaluation in general in academia in pharmacy to make your programs better. Uh, and then we will be discussing an example at the College of Pharmacy performance review and then we will have a brief uh, discussion, group discussions as an activity. As I mentioned, I'm from Italy. And so when I hear about this conference, I just thought about, I will be in Italy anyway in July. So that's a good idea to go to Be Basel. Uh, I got my pharmacy degree at the University of Pavia, which is in the north of Italy, close to Milano. And then I moved to the United States for grad school. I went to Brady for my master in social administrative pharmacy. Uh, this is a private Catholic institution uh, that has a really high quality education. And then after my master, I went to the University of Minnesota for my PhD in social administrative pharmacy. Um, the University of Minnesota is a big 10 school. Um, the Big Ten, they do a lot of research, and uh, the U is a top 10 public research institution in the United States and top 20 overall. Uh, my research expertise, I did some research in community pharmacy services, uh, especially survey and mixed method research, and now I'm more uh, focused in my PhD in pharmacy education and academic pharmacy administrations. I will be doing some case study and uh, using uh, both quantitative and qualitative <coughs> uh, methods. And my career goal is working in academia. So this is a topic that uh, is interesting to me. So what, what are performance reviews? So basically what happens is that uh, usually annually, the faculty and professors at the university, they are reviewed uh, their performance is reviewed, uh, especially in the mission errors they contribute to. 
which are usually teaching, research, service, and practice. And um, what happens is that the supervisor and the employee get together and uh, that they discuss the performance over the past year and set goals for the upcoming year. And these processes are, they start with hiring because they evaluate, they evaluate what a new faculty can bring into a school and they continue during the career. Uh, I don't know about Europe, uh, but in the United States, if you are on a contract faculty, you can get fired very easily. So that's why they, they essentially do performance review. While in my country, for example, we have uh, lifetime contracts. So even in academia, we don't have uh, the performance review because and in any case, you can get fired, basically. But the reason behind performance review uh, are a lot, to be honest. And there are both internal and external reasons why performance reviews are conducted. Uh, from an internal perspective, they are conducted to award promotion and tenure, uh, and also to provide a reward, such as uh, merit salary increases, of course, as I mentioned, renew contracts, but also evaluate and improve the performance. And also other aspects such as improving the career success for your employee and your faculty, and even for the administration of a college, uh, they're used for strategic planning and decision-making because you have to know what your workforce brings to the table to understand what are uh, your strengths and weaknesses and where you can move forward. But they are also conducted for external reasons. There is a lot of uh, uh, movement about addressing the public scrutiny and addressing accountability, which is required by funding agency. Uh, it's also universities do performance reviews to respond to societal expectation and demand for quality of education. Uh, the students, they pay a lot of money. And so the university have to show that their faculty is doing a good performance. And also um, they are conducted to understand the expectations of faculty and make sure that they align with the university mission and goals, especially when there are tax money that goes into the university that has specific goals. You have to make sure that your faculty is following that mission. So a lot of purposes, but essentially uh, this brings a challenge because the performance review, they try to accomplish so many stuff and they eventually they accomplish none of them. Uh, if you take a look at the literature in, uh, in pharmacy academia, uh, most studies are just uh, describing this performance review, which are basically counting or reviewing activities of faculty in the three main mission areas, teaching, research, and service. Uh, but there is also the practice component that sometimes is not uh, evaluated. And eventually, these typical methods of conducting reviews, they receive critiques and dissatisfaction on both faculty and administrators. Uh, the problem uh, with that is that colleges of pharmacy, they have been struggling with uh, conducting a performance review that really captures what a college values and what is, I, has an impact beyond traditional methods. Uh, again, if you take a look at some studies, you may see crazy stuff about calculation and counting the activities that a faculty conducts each year, but essentially these metrics and criteria that are used, they are narrow, they are inconsistently applied among each faculty, and they are incomplete. Uh, and this is a problem because uh, faculty, they don't understand how they are going to be reviewed and they can't make progress 
that are uh, effective. And as a result, there has been a lot of demands for enhanced clarity behind this evaluation criteria. One of the main, I would say issue, but it's not definitely an issue, but performance reviews, they, in any case, and in any study in Pharmacy Academia, they still disproportionately focus on rewarding contribution and activities related to research. So this means publishing articles in uh, high impact journals uh, and getting big money from uh, NIH or other funding agencies. And uh, this is confirmed by the literature, a survey of 197 pharmacy faculty in the United States reported that the most important activities during performance review were peer-reviewed publications, grant funding, and presentation at professional conferences. And these faculty felt like things such as teaching awards or mentoring students or serving on institutional committees, they were less important and they were not rewarded. And another survey report that 30% of more than 200 pharmacy faculty, they reported that service uh, is not proper, properly valued during this performance review. And with that, um, I think it's uh, super important that performance reviews reward the research mission because this is uh, key to pharmacy academia, but uh, they can't miss on other potentially impact contributions that eventually advance both the academia and the profession of pharmacy. And one of the area that is uh, often uh, overlooked is the practice component. Um, a lot of pharmacy faculty in the United States, they have a contract faculty uh, and that the main activities are of their job is to provide clinical services. And they, they may do some uh, small teaching and small research. However, both faculty and administrator, they struggle to differentiate the practice activities of faculty from uh, teaching, research, and service. And they struggle to define the criteria to evaluate this practice contribution. And this eventually led to a problem that the performance reviews, sometimes they don't even formally evaluate practice activities of pharmacy faculty. And this survey reported that 47% of the more than 100 department of pharmacy practice, they didn't have policies or procedures to evaluate practice contribution. And uh, finally, the other main issue is that, uh, as I mentioned, performance review, they are conducted for uh, salary increases, which are usually on an annual basis. But when these are improperly conducted, they create a lot of problems. They decrease job satisfaction, they decrease productivity and performance, which eventually can lead to burnout and turnover. And uh, as reported by the literature, this survey of more than 400 pharmacy faculty, 40% uh, agreed that they department chairs, um, only 40 staff, only 40% agreed that departments are actually able to recognize high quality performance. And another survey reported that the distribution of merit was uh, the lowest scoring item on uh, measurement of just satisfaction. And especially that practice faculty were the most dissatisfied. So basically there are a lot of challenges behind these performance reviews and colleges of pharmacy, they have to do something to prevent uh, job dissatisfaction or low productivity and performance. So how do we improve these processes of evaluation? How do a college of pharmacy understand what are the main issues of their performance review process? Something that 
anybody can use Ternus Academia is program evaluation. So what is that? Uh, program evaluation is a field that essentially teach, teaches you how to conduct a systematic process uh, that collects, analyzes, and uses information to increase understanding and uh, make decision to improve the effectiveness of a program. It could be the performance review, it could be a new academic degree that you want to offer. It could be a new, just a new course that you just implemented. You want to make sure that you understand its features and you want to make sure that you can collect information that can be used to improve that program. Program evaluation has been used anywhere, both in private sector businesses and also in uh, public sector, academia and public organizations. With performance reviews, however, there is not too much uh, a documented approach of program evaluation to improve performance reviews, because basically studies on performance reviews, they just focus on perception of faculty or they are just descriptive studies that describe a, a specific performance review process at a school. So, this is the field of evaluation. It's very broad. It's not that you wake up one day and you start doing it. Uh, in my program, I took uh, this year three classes just on program evaluation in the College of Human Development at Minnesota. And there are a lot of theories behind it. This is just a diagram that describes how to use the information when you conduct an evaluation. Um, the first phase is the context analysis and object description, where you essentially you identify your program and you describe it, its features and its specifics. And again, it could be anything in academia. The second step is the framing the evaluation. You have to understand who are, who are the intended users of the information that you will obtain. It could be maybe your dean or your department head, or it could be the provost, anything in the academic sector. And also you have to understand what is your goals of the evaluation and what are the questions that the evaluation wants to answer. Then you design the evaluation. Uh, typically, uh, you can use both uh, quantitative and qualitative methods to collect data and information about a program and that you create a report so you can have practical information that are going to be used to improve your program. And in this presentation, I will just uh, focusing on the first step, which is describing your program by using logic models. And we'll be talking about logic models because they are very useful, not only for evaluating a program, but also for planning and implementing a new program. This is a really good the first step that uh, it can be easily conducted. So what, what, what's a logic model? Uh, basically, it's a, like a, a roadmap or a picture of a program, and it's a visual representation of inputs, outputs, and outcomes, and how they are related between each other. Inputs, those are basically your resources. It can be financial resources, human resources, and even expertise. So uh, in a program in academic pharmacy, it could be your funding to create a new courses, your faculty that is going to be teaching a new course or just the expertise. The outputs are essentially the activities of the program. Uh, as in the performance review, there are activities related to how evaluation are conducted, but this is just a description of what is going on. And the outcomes, of course, are the benefit and the changes that results from the program. And a logic model is very useful because it's a visualization uh, of the links between what you invest and what you gain from it. Um, and it also bridges the gap between where you are and where you wanna be, because you're describing your outcomes, what you want to achieve, 
And as I mentioned, it's very useful for program design. This is how maybe a logic model actually looks like. Uh, in addition to input, output, and outcomes, there are also the situation and context. And uh, it is very important that you connect with arrows each element in each uh, sector and area. And um, let's move to the example of the performance reviews and program evaluation that was used this past year at the U of M. Um, we will be talking about this department, PCHS, Department of Pharmaceutical Care and Health Systems, because uh, the department changed this performance review process over the past year. What is important is to describe your department. This is a very diverse and eclectic department. Uh, there are 11 contract faculty and there are 12 tenure track faculty. Among them, there are pharmacists, there are non-pharmacists, there are pharmacists who practice in their job, and there are pharmacists who have PhDs who do a lot of research. Uh, this means that these professors, they have very different and diverse effort allocation across mission areas, because maybe there is someone who has a 70% of appointment in research, Maybe there is other who have 70% in clinical practice and 10% in teaching. So it's very diverse. And it's very diverse in terms of research areas. This is a social administrative pharmacy department. There are experts in pharmaceutical economics and policy. There are experts in medication experience and there are experts in um, scholarship of teaching and learning and leadership. So, very different research areas, and this means very different external funding and uh, dissemination cycles in terms of research. And the performance reviews is required by the university policies, and uh, the goal is to assign peer ratings and comments that eventually determine raises, like a salary increase or a special merit. And the challenges, of PCHS are the same as I described before and that I report in the literature. Inconsistent ratings, dissatisfaction, and a feeling of being undervalued uh, despite we have uh, nationally recognized faculty who, who does amazing things. The performance review gets them feeling undervalued. And um, so PCHS redesigned the performance review process for 2022, uh, basically the main goal was to address uh, the challenges and achieve more consistency in peer ratings. And uh, the main goal of the redesign was to expand the definition of the impact of an activity and contribution of a faculty. So expanding this definition could lead to a greater understanding of the importance of, a, of a, the accomplishment of faculty among everyone and eventually achieve greater consistency in peer ratings. So where did ECHS start? From designing a logic model, as I mentioned, this is very useful for planning and, and implementation of a program. The situation that I described before, uh, dissatisfaction, feeling undervalued, and a need to recognize high impact contribution across all mission areas. Uh, and the priority is to expand this definition of impact and achieve greater consistency in ratings. Uh, resources of the performance review. There was a team that redesigned the performance review. Uh, there was one graduate student and three faculty. Um, and as I, as I described, there was uh, a research base and expertise in annual reviews and program evaluation. Other resources, of course, faculty and uh, department administrators. Uh, as for the activities, I will discuss this later. Essentially, there will be a description of uh, how 
the performance review was changed and uh, how and what are the new activities and the outcomes that PCHS wanted to achieve. They wanted to recognize high impact across all mission areas, promote faculty success, do a more consistent peer review, and having defined contribution that are value because they are important for the pharmacy profession and the pharmacy academia. And this is also useful for uh, the college itself because it builds confidence in how performance reviews are conducted and gives to the college team uh, a clear identity of the department. So, as I mentioned before, the main goal was to expand the definition of uh, impact and um, the main thing that was done was to describe how faculty activities can have an impact based on the college strategic plan. So how did this process is conducted? Essentially, uh, we described uh, all of the contribution that we could think of in teaching research, service, and practice. As for teaching, there is classroom teaching, active learning teaching, and also experience, um, experiential education in practice selling. There are also course improvement and teaching innovations, mentoring and advising, uh, interprofessional teaching with other programs such as nursing or medicine, uh, publication and grants related to teaching, and also teaching awards and administration. As for research, there is uh, grant funding, publication and presentations, also intellectual properties through patents, and uh, serving as a journal editor or reviewer, and uh, also obtaining research awards. As for service, there is academic service on institutional committees, but there is also professional service in um, organization. You can serve on a committee of a pharmacy organization, and also you can do some service in the community. As for practice, there is direct patient care provision, indirect patient care, and also improving uh, and creating new practice model, and uh, also securing new practice environments for your students. So a lot of activities, and basically they were in a document we described how each activity was connected to the strategic plan of the college. The strategic plan has goals that the college wants to achieve. And so we just described how an activity can be connected to a specific goal. So faculty, their performance review, they could describe their annual activities and they could say, these activities is improving this college's goal or not. And this was as an effort to expand the definition of impact. That was the description of what the faculty were provided. Uh, the actual performance review uh, is conducted through three steps. A self-review that, that each faculty do. A peer review where there is a panel of faculty peer reviewers who review their, college, their colleagues. And then the, we have a department peer review where um, the department administrators, they provide additional ratings and then they send the ratings to the dean who determines the special uh, merit salary. Uh, these are the activities of the performance review. There was a description about the performance review. Uh, the ratings were provided on a nine point scale because that was a college decision. The first step, as I mentioned, is the self-review. Basically, each faculty, they write narratives of their annual accomplishment. They self-rate themselves, and then they describe one or two links between their activities and the College of Pharmacy goals with the strategic plan. Then these ratings, they go to 
the peer review where there are faculty who uh, review their colleagues and provide additional rate and they use the self ratings kind of as a guidance as an effort to improve uh, consistency and then these ratings they go to the department head and uh, who basically assign additional ratings they uh, sit down with each faculty to discuss accomplishment and new goals for the upcoming year and then they submit ratings to the dean so this was the performance review itself and the changes that were made to improve it. Uh, did it work? I don't know, probably, maybe not. Uh, especially because it's so challenging to recognize everyone's contribution. And um, for this reason, we decided to move uh, this project more about understanding how the, a performance review process influenced the overall organizational culture at the department. Uh, so we'll be I will be focusing more about organizational culture and performance and understanding the factors that are related to performance review and that affect organizational culture. And this, again, is connected to productivity, performance, and satisfaction. So which are key elements to uh, a college or an, or an academic department. Before doing uh, our group discussion, does anybody have any questions? Okay, yeah. So you just explained the whole process. Yeah. Right? I was waiting for results. And yeah. instead of results, you said, so we're gonna do something else now. So what were the results? What did you find? Yeah, basically it was it was easy when we got the ratings. Uh, it was easy to understand that there was not consistency between each ratings. As I mentioned, three steps: self rating, peer rating, department rating. We changed the process to obtain greater consistency. There was not there was not greater consistency, but. This was helpful because it makes us aware of uh, what would work and what couldn't work. And uh, so I will be moving forward with uh, a project about organizational culture and understanding how the perceptions of performance review affect that. Do you yeah. have an explanation why there was no difference or? The results that Noah wanted to know, you said we changed the process, but at the end it was exactly the same as before. Sorry, for the question is, do you have an explanation? Can you explain why you did not ameliorate your? I don't. Maybe I will get more data moving forward. I will be doing a survey and then some focus groups. You are now looking for one. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because it seems to be so much effort. And then in the end, you don't really know what, if you can trust the results, is it correct? Uh, yeah, you, you can trust the results. The problem with these performance reviews is that, as I mentioned, this is, uh, has been an ongoing struggle in pharmacy academia in the United States. Uh, and especially for social administrative science, because there is so much diversity. Maybe for programs such as a MedCam or pharmaceutics, they are very, they are not diverse. Each professor, they do very similar research and maybe their metrics work well. But when you have a very different workforce, it's tough to get everybody on the same page and understand what really matters in evaluating their performance. We have a question in uh, Chicago. Yeah. Oh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Federico. Thank you for your presentation. 
Um, one one question is: Would you comment on the? You're talking about the diversity. Is there strength? I, I, I'm thinking of NIH review panels. That there's strength of maybe one person saying, "I'm going to rate this grant proposal," or in your example, this this performance review in a very positive way, and then another person may bring a different perspective and say, "Well, I'll be more critical." Um, I find that the differences can be as informative as the consistency. What would be your opinion in applying that in performance reviews? Is that something that creates more problems or could it be developed into a strength to expand our perspectives? Yeah, that's a really good comment. And uh, yeah, I feel like it can be helpful. Uh, I didn't mention, but I feel like this diversity in performance is the is actually the strength of this social administrative pharmacy department they, because they can do a lot of stuff and they can connect with other fields as well. So it's not easy to evaluate, but uh, maybe if you take a look from another perspective. Uh, maybe you can find a way and th that was a good suggestion so thanks does anybody have other questions Frederico, oh, sorry Is there yeah go, go ahead from chicago uh, one other question is um i assume the faculty is uh within the larger university is there any alignment that needs to happen with faculty performance reviews between the faculty and other faculties in the university? That's a good question. So the University of Minnesota is probably one of the most decentralized university in the United States. So each college and each department, they make decision on their own. What the consistency between each faculty is that they have to submit uh, their activities through uh, university software, which is called Works. And um, it is essentially mostly a report of your activities. But then the performance reviews uh, is different. And uh, it's a very big uh, university. And um, as I mentioned, any college and department, they make their own decision. Any other questions? Did you have a question? Uh, well, it was more of a comment. Yeah, I guess it depends on whether or not there are expectations set at the beginning of a year. So either as contractors, tenure track that you say, okay, well, what I expect from you is that you publish this paper that you or if you're not publishing, then I expect that you're doing one TRS teaching or whatever the case may be. And I suppose then it's easier if you have set the expectations to say, well, you did or you did not reach that goal. And then, you know, it's, it almost objectifies it a bit more. Is there any of that? Yeah, that's a good comment because this is what uh, happens uh, traditionally. Uh, However, as I mentioned before, there are challenges with that. Uh, you can say you have to publish something, but maybe there is someone who does a research product, project, which is a couple of years long, and he and here they publish, I don't know, four, five, six papers. And then the next year, they don't publish because maybe they are just working on framing a new project. So those quantitative metrics, they may not work every time, or especially in this field where there is a lot of differences in the dissemination cycles of your research. And also things like service and service on an institutional committee, whether it could be a curriculum committee, uh, admission committees, or even uh, more at the university level. Uh, how do you quantify your activities and how do you actually quantify the outcomes that the results from it you can just say well you serve on five committees that great that is uh, you are meeting your expectation but i can i can say you just showed up you don't do anything 
you just show up in uh, with other professor, but essentially there is no impact. So it's great to have expectations, but uh, you have also to be aware that those expectations, they may not work every time. Okay. Okay. So if there is an, any other question, we can do, um, we have maybe 15, 20 minutes. We can do uh, a little bit of group discussions and we can have one group here and we can have the other group in Chicago. Uh, if you have a laptop, otherwise I can uh, show you. So basically we will be responding to three main questions and discussing. We will report major themes on a Jamboard, which works great on a laptop. Otherwise you can download the app. Uh, it's a Google app, or you can try to use it on the browser of your smartphone, but maybe it doesn't work very well. And then we will compare the themes that emerge between each groups. So, uh, here we can use a laptop and we can discuss and, and uh, I can uh, manage the Jamboard. Uh, again, you can download it in Chicago from your smartphone or you can just discuss uh, and uh, write on a paper and then I can report at the end uh, myself by using the laptop. Uh, the Jamboard is at this link. Uh, C slash ISPW22. And I'm going to open it. Let's see. Okay. It is the same for the laptop? No. You said laptop or smartphone. Yeah, it, uh, whatever works best for you. If you don't want to use it, we, we can just take notes and I can insert that information on the Jamboard. Uh, usually what you can do in this Jamboard, you can insert uh, a sticky note. It's similar to the tablet, right? Yeah, you can uh, just write something and then uh, you can just uh, include your main ideas and then I can manage the format. So let's... Okay, so we have only two groups. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's take, I would say 15 or 20 minutes. So it's 6.15, why don't we come back at 6.30, okay? So we can uh, <laughs> yeah. Great.
Okay. Yeah. Because it is bottom of the hour. Yeah. Hello from Chicago. <laughs> We're ready. Hi, are you there? Hello, Basil. Hi, sorry, we, were, we are a little bit late, so That's we are okay. from, from Chicago. Already. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get in, Jamboard. Just tell us whenever you're ready. We have it all on paper and we can, um, I can relay our discussions here. Great, you can go ahead. Okay, so for the first question about the contributions that are valued by um, faculty performance reviews, we talked about um, research funding, uh, the type and the source of the funding, so the notoriety that comes with some of that funding. Um, we also mentioned impact factor journals, um, you know, the rating in the field, um, the target audience, that should actually be included, but usually it's just impact factor of the journal that's regarded. Uh, we discussed the role in the project. So whether you're a PI or a, a collaborator or a co-I, uh, we talked about publications, whether you're first or last author. Um, we talked about contributions to policy, uh, media, um, and some of the newer ways of measuring impact, um, such as, uh, you know, evidence of impact through social media engagements, um, Twitter, things such as that. Anything else? Yeah, that's great. There were some, uh, some of the same comments also here, especially related to publication and impact factors and research. And um, I agree that in the US, they are trying to recognize um, and they are trying to use the metrics about impact. So they take a look not only at your publication, they take a look at blogs or uh, other type of dissemination, podcast, uh, even social media, um, because that's another way to report what your doing uh okay how about the second question okay so for the second question about um, what we think should be rewarded um within the faculty performance reviews there was an interesting a very enlightening comment made about how in the first question you're just looking at contributions but in the second question, you're actually looking at what contributions are rewarded for institutional and societal impact. So that's the big difference between what's currently happening and what should be happening. So, uh, a, you know, a great definition of impact really is where we should be headed with that. So redefining impact. And then we should also be thinking about um, things or contributions that are currently being um, made that are not uh, rewarded. Things such as mentoring pharmacy students or pharmacists, engaging with the community that you're serving, um, you know, changing society and health systems through the work that you're doing, um, interprofessional uh, work and interprofessional contributions. So not just contributing to your profession, but to other professions and vice versa with the work that you're doing. Um, valuing team taught courses, um, you know, uh, determining what a coordination of uh, uh, courses and how that different differentiates from contact hours and whether those contact hours are content delivery. So just didactic lectures versus um, interactive and active learning um, content delivery. And that also should be considered. Anything else? Great. Awesome. Okay. 
uh, great. I feel like here uh, we got a lot of uh, discussion about open science and disseminating uh, anything that academia produced. Uh, maybe have uh, the, en the entire community or population understanding what the academia, uh, what academia does. And also there were comments about having more collaborations between other schools and other universities, not only nationally, but also internationally. And uh, also some comments about uh, recruiting and creating the new generation of workforce and just training uh, the new generations. And um, yes. How about the last questions from Chicago? Did, do you have any comments? Yes, we do. Um, we had lots of comments about this. So we had quite a bit of a discussion about, um, you know, consistency and equity. So first and foremost, I think um, we should target not counting beans um, in terms of our contributions, but actually um, ensuring that we're putting in mind or putting in focus the well being and the growth of our colleagues with faculty performance review so that these can be used to um, further help our junior faculty grow and meet their goals. Um, so using a, the FBR as a, as a, a tool to help with that. Um, valuing research that is not currently valued or mainstream, for example, community engagement research. Um, you know, we, some um, members, some colleagues may value uh, publications differently or may not even recognize the, the publications uh, of our colleagues because we do not know the publications or the, know the types of publications. Um, we talked about consistency, whether we actually want consistency uh, because that can be very formulaic and very rigid. And maybe we want a consensus and we want dissenting opinions because sometimes those dissenting opinions help um, us grow and help us focus um, on our research and goals. Um, we talked about um, equity, not just you know gender uh, bias or implicit bias, not just with gender, but um, other things, you know, with um, the type of research we do, we have lots of implicit bias with one person's research versus an the value of one person's research versus another's, the value of publications of one person versus another's, the value of, um, you know, uh, hier hierarchical impact on value as well. We may review each other's work and, um, you know, think it's great work and then send it up to another level who may think that that is not appropriate or you know have their own implicit bias against what um what we are valuing our colleagues as so Perfect. any other comments okay and that's uh that's the end of that section then thanks for uh, the comments i really appreciate do we does anybody here wants to say something about what they were saying is extremely abstract. How do you want to transform this in an indicator? Because at the end, you want to measure something to yeah. be able to say if you are good or not. And all these words are so beautiful, but how do you measure? So I like the term that you use, Chicago, do not count beans. But at the end, I think this is the easiest way to do it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I agree. Uh, the counting shouldn't be done, but as you mentioned, it's easier if you do that. Uh, What's the alternative if you don't count? That's, that's a good question. That's a something Can that... Give you an example from school, from Swiss school. So when I was at school, you had a mark. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you knew where you were. You had to be the point cross at just 20 and so on. So this is not equi this is not equitable. So we don't have marks. Now we have commentary, like pass and fail. But 
when you have pass and fail, it is so weak. You don't know, you cannot compare yourself. So counting has an advantage. And it depends how you construct the scale. So in my view, the whole discussion is about do we have the scale that is really, really giving an indication, or do you have a, a, a biased scale or a skewed scale? So, like when we, we do evaluation with the students, and everybody is good and smiling everywhere because the scales are skewed. Mm -hmm. So, beautiful words, beautiful um, tendency, ideas, whatever, but at the end, you don't have the instrument to really measure what you want to measure. So impact factor is ugly, but you have a number mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So I wish you good luck in your career of the Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I love to do in the 25 coming years. <laughs> Federico? Yes. Add to that. As, I think that was Isabel, and yes. the pass-fail pass ideas is just, we, uh, we've been talking here about campus legal likes to keep things simple. So at the University of Wisconsin, it's meets and does not meet. You don't get to say on paper someone exceeds expectations because that gives someone a chance to say, well, then they, everybody should be exceeding expectations. Maybe we need to get rid of the meets people. Mm -hmm. So. That's why we have it very clear cut. But as you noted, Isabel, you know, it's then everybody's like, I'm getting a pass or a fail. I'm like, you know, so we're all going to be passing. And it doesn't acknowledge the diversity and innovation happening around the, the, your program that you're by the folks. Um, so it's you wrestle with that a little bit. OK. Uh, any other? Final comments for, from Chicago, do you have anything to add? Nope, I think we're good here. <laughs> Great. Great. Great so, discussion. yeah, thanks so much for uh, participating in the discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you both those in Chicago and here, I really appreciate your involvement. Okay. <laughs>